On our last show, we covered the introduction to Software Defined Access, but today we cover the details. It's time for the deep dive. It's time for TechWise TV. Our deep dive follow on from the introductory show we did for software defined access. Now, SD access is policy based automation from edge to cloud. Now, Rob, I think you have a recap. I do. You know, there is just so much to consider when we talk about the architectural change that offers this many benefits. So, what I wanted to do was highlight a little bit about what we'd covered on that previous show. So this diagram shows the centrality of two things, right? We've got the APKM controller and DNA center both here at the center. The controller's not new, however, what you can now do with it changes everything. See, the APKEM now functions as an SDN controller. It's still valuable as usual. In fact, you may already be using it for any number of things, say, um, well, easy QoS, path trace, plug and play, but it's also fully accessible and open through APIs. Now, DNA Center, put a big star next to that one, DNA Center is brand new. This is the control center. It's the only interface you need for a completely automated software-defined access network. We go into detail about what you can do here in the previous intro episode, but it's at a high level. And it falls under these four pillars, right? Provisioning, policy, design, assurance for administrative control. Now, policy, policy refers to how we define and manage the conditions, the constraints, and the settings for who is authorized and under what circumstances. Provisioning, well, that covers the onboarding of people and devices from the sites all the way to the IP addresses. Design over here. Design includes building your site hierarchy, your image management, and the network profiles. It can greatly simplify provisioning and a whole lot of other activities. And now assurance. Well, assurance is the final module that you might not even be used to thinking was possible. Because by definition, assurance means freedom from doubt. And when you apply that to the operation of your network, that's where things get really interesting. It's that, it's that crucial, elusive 360-degree view for the, the clients, the devices, the apps, and it's using real-time data for making all the tweaks and allowing you to resolve issues. Now, NDP, we're getting back into the product and technology side here, NDP is new. It's the analytics engine for delivering assurance. And we've got an entire episode dedicated to what this is and how to get it started, so check that out for more details. Now, switching over to the far other side, Cisco ISE. You guys know this one, ICE, we call it, the Identity Services Engine. It's been a unique value-added component featured a whole bunch on this show, but now it plays a key role as the policy store. It is unrivaled in its ease of use nowadays and the value that it can, that it can provide for you even if you don't decide to pursue SD access at this point in time. Now, underlying everything here, this is the devices that get stuff done. We are all familiar with the routers, the switches, the wireless controllers, the access points. Support for SD access may only require an iOS update. I mean, talk about investment protection. And today we're peeking a bit further under the covers so we can see the reality of how Cisco has combined so many existing technologies, filled in the gaps with the missing bits and pieces so we can finally get true automation and simplicity in our networks. SD Access offers simplification through automation. Now, how do we back that up? Well, we reveal the ingrained challenges we have all dealt with for so long that we may have quit asking how and why they have never been addressed. And then we illustrate how existing mature technology, plus a few new items to fill in the gaps, can give you a simple, secure, policy-based network running from the edge to the cloud. Now, Carl Solder joins Rob in the lounge to get us started right now. Well, Carl, I apologize we couldn't get you a more comfortable room in the back okay. there because uh, it's good keeping you around because there's a lot of uh, your brain I still want to tap here. We're doing a deep dive. So yes. this is a complimentary tie-in to the introductory show that we did. Yes. Um, and so with that, let's get in a little bit deeper, still introductory to the deep dive. Um, what problems would you say we're trying to solve, or we are solving, I should be more confident, that we are solving with uh, SD Access? Uh, good question, Rob. So I think... Uh, there's a number of problems we're trying to solve. Uh, I would bucket them in these kind of four categories. First one is around provisioning. Today, we have customers who have device add devices with thousands of features. They're saying it's getting too hard to figure out which combination of features mm. we uh, install to, to extract maximum value from the okay. device that we've just invested in. So providing the ability to install world-class configurations, best practice configurations with the minimum number of clicks. Okay. That's the starting point. On the policy side, it's two things. It's about 
policy application, and it's also about creating user segments. So we have tried to synthesize and simplify the whole segmentation process down to making the hardest problem to solve as being what name you're going to give your virtual segment. Really? Right, yeah. And then clicking the button and having that application applied across the entire Because when network. you say segmentation, I think most people have a bunch of problems that suddenly come up. Yeah, and do fear I do and uncertainty VLANs, and VRFs, MPLS VPNs. Yeah. I mean, Ugh. what do I do? So taking yeah, the headache tomorrow. away from that. Maybe yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> um, also, how we assign consistent policy across all the different ki kinds, of, uh, kinds of devices that we have in the network. Routers, switches, mm. access There's points. There's another one that scares me. They have slightly different ways in configuration mode to right. apply that. So how can we do that consistently so that irrespective of how and when I connect to the network or where, I'm going to have the right policy assigned to me. And then last but not least, it's about understanding exactly what the heck's going on in your network. Ah. You've got users, you've got devices, you've got things, you've got applications running across your network. Rather than getting into the CLI and saying, okay, show interface, packet count, byte count, I mean, that's okay, but what does it really tell me? Mm -hmm. It's much better if I know that Rob Boyd uh, logged onto the network at 8.09 in the morning. He's using five applications. Oracle is one of those. Oracle's having a little bit of a problem, and I'm going to give you some guidance around where I think that problem might be occurring and, and maybe some suggestions around how to fix that. That's really what we're talking about. Talking to the GDN. IT side, you're not going to ask Rob. No. You're just handling it for Rob. Just handling it for Rob. I, I like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Okay. Why have we not done this kind of thing sooner? Because it feels like we've known about these problems for a long time. We have known about these problems for a long time, and I think part of it is just the size and the enormity of the problem set of how we go about solving Because we have it. tried to tackle them, but it's been adding stuff on, I think, historically. We have, and, and if you look across the industry, there's been attempts at solving slices of the problem. Yeah. The whole SD-WAN uh, solutions that are coming out in the market right now are trying to address the problems in the WAN side. Right. You know, wireless has had its attempts. You know, we've, we've started to look at enterprise, but really, we haven't got the right technology pieces to solve this as a whole. Uh, now, I think with the maturity of a lot of the developments that have happened on the SDN forefront across the industry and also within Cisco, we've taken a lot of those lessons and we're bringing them together. And I think now we've got the right package of technology components to solve it in a single way. So now's the right time. Now's the right time. And obviously we want people to start testing this and working with it. Uh, but just before you go, and before we go back over to the lab to get into more depth on this, mm -hmm. set up for us the technologies that are being used to do this? Because I think they're, they're familiar names or stuff we've they heard are. of, perhaps not in the enterprise side. So underlying uh, technology foundation elements, VXLAN okay. for our data transport. LISP, which is our control plane, keeping track of where users are in the network. The whole TrustSec architecture, which is our framework for assigning the policy. There are three very key components I think we're going to explore in a little while. But also the notion around fabric. What is a fabric? Yeah. What are the key fabric components? We have border node, we have control plane, we have edge node. What do they are? What do they do? You know, when do you create them? How do you create them? I think these are all elements that we'll discuss. And they're not about necessarily adding new stuff on no. and getting rid of what you've got. This is just about existing roles changing a bit for it devices is. a lot of people may already have in their network. It is. Just to make sure that that's clear. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think we have to have an understanding of that so that you know, when you come to implement this, you'll have a better under understanding of exactly what you have to do. All right. Carl, thank you so much. Thank you, Rob. All right, we're going to get deep. We're going over to Sean and Lauren, and uh, they're going to talk about those roles, talk about what it means in this SD access, and make sure you understand as we go a little bit further. Thanks for hanging with us. Welcome back to TechWise TV, Sean. We're so happy to have you here. Thanks, Lauren. Um, we're talking about SD Access. What is ac SD Access? We've actually had Campus Fabric as a product shipping for a little while. So, so SD Access is really taking Campus Fabric and then adding all the automation and assurance on top of it. Okay, so that makes sense if I know what a fabric is, but <laughs> maybe maybe we should dive into first what what is a fabric. Okay. Or especially what is Campus Fabric? What's yeah. unique about that? Well, so, so to start out with, you know, uh, we use the term fabric a lot. Um, it, it's not a, unusual or unique, um, but the campus fabric is, is really based on um, this concept of an underlay and an overlay. Okay, so if you hear the term fabric, that's what people mean. They mean an overlay. So you start out with your, you know, traditional network, the way that you think of it, right? Switches, switches, routers, yeah, okay. protocols. They mm -hmm. they actually have their own protocols, their own control plane. Um, but we're, we're using this now just as a transport mechanism. So that's where this term underlay comes from. It's just underneath. And then when you think of a fabric, it's really running over the top, right? So, so a logical, that's right. almost virtual kind of? Yeah, but, okay. that's right. It's just virtually running mm. between the different edge devices and, and 
it really doesn't matter what's in the middle from a transport perspective. So I've got my hardware, it's set up, pristine, forwarding stuff, great. Yep. Okay. And, and most importantly, the, the host themselves, the end devices, they don't actually know what's in the middle, right? They just know they connect to this device, they get out on the other side, and, and it's done. It's all smoke right. and mirrors. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's all <laughs> magic. Well, the magic actually comes from encapsulation. Okay. All right, so that's the other important thing here is, is about the encapsulation. Uh, I'm just putting additional information on the, on the header that gets me from one side to the other side. So encapsulation isn't that difficult on it. I mean, we're already using GRE, MPLS. That's right, yeah. Like that, so. We have lots of examples of mm -hmm. encapsulation, so okay. it's actually pretty common. Uh, but it's really important to keep this picture in your mind, mm -hmm. uh, because if, if you keep this picture in your mind, then all the other things in Campus Fabric become very simple. I love this slide, because a lot of people don't understand overlay necessarily. Just remember, it's kind of living above it, right? That's right, that's right. A fabric is an overlay. <laughs> So, uh, you know, th I also get asked frequently, like, why an overlay, right? So as I created this, just to kind of explain that. Now, imagine yourself, that's you, right? And yeah. uh, you're the average. Looks just like me. <laughs> completely. <laughs> um, you actually have, you know, two competing uh, requests that are coming at you as the average IT person. So the business naturally wants you to maximize uptime, right? It's natural. Keep yeah. the business running all the time, no matter what. Right. So our nature is to keep things simple. Right? Don't turn on any special features. Don't do any complex uh, types of programming. Just keep it simple. Mm -hmm. Right? At the same time, you know, you've got all kinds of new users. I know on the show you guys have talked a lot about you know all these new capabilities, IoT, and these things. But you know, how is the IT person going to keep it simple and add all these new capabilities? Right? So, so one of the beautiful parts about an underlay overlay model is the underlay actually solves that maximize uptime. Keep it simple, just you know, put in maximum redundancy, mm -hmm. maximum links, mm -hmm. and don't touch it. Its only job is to forward. There you go. Right? On the other hand, having a logical topology, like you said, uh, in the overlay, now I can give you all these services. This is where all the flexibility and all the magic comes from. Even new services, maybe through... You may not even yeah. imagine them yet. Right, okay. That's right. So Campus Fabric is really broken down to three major things. Um, the first part is the uh, control plane mm -hmm. based on location identity separation protocol, or LISP. Uh, then we're going to use a, a new data plane, which is the encapsulation piece, uh, using virtual extensible LAN or, or VXLAN. Mm -hmm. okay? um, now, the extra piece is uh, the policy plane, and that's based on Cisco TrustSec. So, I mean, I've seen all of these protocols before. What's really new here? Yeah, that's an excellent point. Uh, all of these have been around for a long time, uh, several years, in fact. Uh, and they've been deployed widely in different areas of the network. Uh, what's new is really bringing them all together, okay? Um, and in many cases, uh, they've only been in the data center or they've only been in service provider or only specific situations. Um, so really putting all three of them together and making a unique fabric for the campus is what's new. So, and then with DNA Center on top, I can automate all that. From That's right. An easy GUI. Exactly, all right. exactly. So let's look a little bit closer at each one of these, uh, starting off with uh, the control plane. So, you know, the real goal of LISP is to um, simplify your routing, to create that overlay mm -hmm. network, right? And if you do that in a traditional way, the, the problem with uh, traditional routing protocols is they're very heavy, mm -hmm. right? Um, it works. We've been doing it for 20, 30 sure. years. Uh, but I have to keep track of every single address, and any time something changes, I have to update that address. Yeah, it takes right? up space, takes up, yeah. Okay. CPU and all mm -hmm. these things. So, so one of the reasons, uh, one of the main reasons to go with Lisp is that it actually separates the host addresses from the topology addresses. Okay. Right? Um, and in this way, I only have to keep track of things that are local to me, mm -hmm. um, and it's a map-based system, so everything is kept in this central mapping system, which makes the whole thing very, very lightweight. So I have like a database just full of where things are, yep. but, but it's Lisp, so it's location, identity, separation, protocol. That's right. Lisp is one of the few acronyms that actually means what it sounds <laughs> like. Yeah. Um, now, the most common analogy for Lisp is DNS. DNS for routing, basically. Mm -hmm. So when you have DNS, your, your computer is basically asking, where is Cisco.com? It doesn't know where Cisco.com is. Uh, and the DNS server replies with, hey, this is the IP for Cisco.com. It says, OK, I know where to send it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, apply that same kind of thinking to routing. I don't know where this destination address is. I'm trying to reach Lauren. I don't know where Lauren's at. Uh, 
I just ask the map system, where's Lauren right now? Yeah. It returns, it says Lauren's over here. I say, okay, great. I'll send it over there. I mean, it's really like dynamic routing, except a little more flexible, I guess. That's right. That's right. So as you dig a little deeper into Lisp, uh, there's a couple of key things to keep track of, a couple of names that you'll hear. Um, and you know, these are all just the high points for Campus Fabric. Um, you'll hear us talk a lot about endpoint identifiers. Mm -hmm. So this is your actual IP address. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be like a specific slash 32 or a specific MAC address okay. for that host. And then you hear uh, routing locators. Um, and that's just a fancy way of saying the interface of that router or switch. OK. Right? Now, the whole magic is through this mapping system. We talked about that. It's the DNS for routing, right? And it's really simple. All you have to do is make a mapping between where is this endpoint and what's the router it's currently connected to. It's like a, a telephone book for cell phones. That's right. Exactly <laughs> right. Uh, so you can have just one map server. You can have multiple map servers for redundancy, these kind of things. But the important thing here is just a simple mapping between the endpoint ID and the routing locator, right? And this map server is, uh, in fact, a server. It's living on a switch somewhere. It's Good question. Uh, it can be either or. Okay. Uh, it actually can run on a Cisco iOS router or uh, iOS switch. Um, but we can also support that externally on a, like a virtual machine. Perfect. So once I have the mapping system, like I said, the, the edge devices, all they need to do is ask, where is this at? Right, and that's these these tunnel routers. Uh, they also perform the uh, encapsulation and the encapsulation, so putting that VXLAN mm -hmm. header on. Uh, but when they need to figure out, you know, where is Lauren, right? They're going to ask the map system, "Where's Lauren?" And the map system will tell them and say, "Okay, I'm going to send that packet now to the other side." And that's as simple as that. Seems easy. Yeah, it's very easy. Uh, there is a special one uh, called a proxy tunnel router, um, and this is basically if I don't know where else to go, right? So if if the map system doesn't know where it is. Just send it to the proxy tunnel router, and that's mainly used for things like the internet. Yeah, well, so just don't outside know my internal network. Yeah, that's right. That's or maybe right. just a different network within. That's right. Mm -hmm. But behavior is, is the same as a tunnel router. That's why we just call it a proxy tunnel router. Okay. Everything else is the same. Very, very simple. All right. So one of the things I emphasized in the beginning was host mobility, right? Identity separation, right? So uh, one of the key things in this example is just to show that, you know, in this example, uh, I've got a guy here in building one. It's going to talk to some application in the data center, pretty standard stuff. But I want to emphasize what happens when he moves to a different building. Right? So that's what I'm trying to show here. Kind of a high level packet walk. That's right. That's right. How, how does mobility actually happen? So when he first starts talking, um, and as we said, you know, the, the first top router, his job is just to say, hey, he's connected to me right now. Right? So the map system says, OK. Uh, and what I do want to draw attention to is I'm advertising a slash 32. So that means this exact host address, and he's currently connected to this edge device. Sure. Okay. And from there, traffic starts flowing. It's fine. He says, you know, where's this data center device? It's over here. Send it. Okay. Kind of how it's always worked. Yeah. But what happens if he moves over to a different building, right? Traditionally, you would have to change your IP address, mm -hmm. right? So that doesn't happen any longer. So now what happens is when the host starts communicating on the other side, the other first hop switch will say, oh, he's currently connected to me, right? So he then updates the map system and says he's connected to me now, oh. right? Uh, meanwhile, the map system will tell the old guy, hey, he's connected to this new one, and then traffic continues. And the right gateways are over here, too. Yep. Okay. In fact, we use a Anycast gateway, so they can be the same on every edge switch. Perfect. Okay. Now, the same kind of thing happens in reverse. Uh, initially, the, the data center application will be sending to this specific device, right? Because that's what the last thing he was told to do. Um, when the host moves over, uh, the host that is no longer connected, right, he'll say, hey, I don't have them anymore. Please check with the map system. So it's as simple as that. He then says, checks with the map system. Meanwhile, the, the new device is connected, and the traffic continues. And this all happens pretty quickly? I yeah, a few hope. hundred milliseconds is oh, the wow. most. Yeah, Very fast. Um, it's actually, you know, we use the DNS analogy. It's very, very lightweight, a few kilobits per second, and it happens very, very quickly. Okay. That's, yep. yeah, important, right? <laughs> yeah. So next, let's look at the, the VXLAN piece. Uh, of course, we start out with our original frame, right? It's got IP and it's got Ethernet. Um, now, Lisp does have its own encapsulation, uh, but it was built for IP mobility because it's, it's identity separation, right? Mm -hmm. So the key thing about Lisp is uh, decoupling the IP from its location. Um, but when we would do it, we would throw away the MAC address. I don't need that for IP, right? Um, so right. We're at layer three now. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're just pure layer three, pure IP mm -hmm. communication. So it's, it's considered a layer three overlay. 
Now, now one of the reasons we chose to use VXLAN, uh, which is you know now prevalent in the data center, uh, is it carries the Ethernet frame with it. Okay. And why is that important? What does that actually do for us? Yeah, so if I only used layer three, I could only ever communicate at IP. If I had any broadcast traffic or link local multicast that, that's using a MAC address, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to support that. Yeah, that makes sense. So by doing this, I can actually support both layer two and layer three. So we get kind of a hybrid. That's right. It's, a, it's the best of both worlds. Yeah. So we talked earlier about you know the underlay and the overlay, and I, I said encapsulation is probably the, the magic, the most important piece. So um, I've organized this just to look at the VXLAN header um, and kind of show you uh, the underlay pieces and the overlay pieces. And the underlay, this is what all the intermediate devices see in the middle. So when they're, when they're communicating, the device in the middle, they only see IP. Mm -hmm. they, as far as they know, it's just a normal IP packet. It has a standard UDP header. They don't know any different about it. Just okay? regular, yeah, Ethernet. They don't have mm -hmm. to uh, support Canvas Fabric at all. It's mm -hmm. just basic IP to them. Um, now, one of the interesting things about the UDP header is that's uh, actually what identifies it as a VXLAN frame. So when it finally does get over to the other side, the other side says, oh, this is a VXLAN frame. Let me take a look at it. Okay. Uh, unpack it more. Unpack it more. That's right. And that's where the, the VXLAN header kind of kicks in, right? So one of the things, in addition to being able to carry the original uh, Ethernet header, uh, we can now use other fields within the VXLAN header, and that's kind of the new magical piece of it. Sounds like you're about to tell us some interesting things about the information we can carry here. That's right. So, because that's like really the connection for the third point, which was the policy plane with uh, Cisco TrustSec. So, one of the new things that Cisco's done is actually take, extend uh, the original VXLAN and add virtual routing and forwarding, mm -hmm. as well as uh, Cisco TrustSec with uh, scalable group tags into the VXLAN header itself. Yeah, the VRF kind of gives us that network isolation if we need That's it. That's right. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about scalable group tags. That's right, yeah. So, you know, unfortunately you can't talk about TrustSec without talking about what, what's the problem. So, you know, we've built networks based on IP forever, and, and just like Lisp decoupled the uh, IP from its location, the goal of TrustSec is really to decouple its identity from its IP address. Right, because as long as I have addresses, I have to build my policies based on those addresses. It's the only way I know, know how to do it. So we're still talking about host mobility. We're just talking about, you know, so great. Okay, that host can still communicate, but is the policy still being assigned? And that's where TrustSec comes in. That's right. That's right. So you know, we've been doing this for for you know twenty thirty years. Everybody you know loves to build address based access lists right. and uh, <laughs> all the complexity that comes with that. So easily readable. Yes, and <laughs> don't change anything. Um, so, so the key goal uh, in this particular case is to uh, give something else other than address to, to make the identity. Um, so what they came up with was this uh, group-based tag. Okay, um, And when a user comes in, they get a, associated with this tag. And now, whenever I build an access list, I only have to use the tag. I don't actually care what its IP address is anymore. But before VXLAN, we couldn't carry that information from source to destination, right? Well, we've had TrustSec for several years, okay. um, but it was carried in a specific part of the layer two header. Um, and this actually made it complicated for people to actually deploy TrustSec. Uh, so one of the beautiful things about using the VXLAN is now, because it's an overlay, right? I can actually finally uh, realize the advantages of TrustSec. Yeah. Very cool. All right, so you know how do the users actually get into the the actual group? Um, that's where earlier when I talked about um, you know software defined access and interacting with other pieces, this is where the Cisco Identity Services comes in. Um, so after it's authenticated all the devices, then you just start building these groups, group tags, right? And all of my access lists are based on that group tag, right? Mm -hmm. So this is standard TrustSec thing. Um, but the really important thing here is, you know, we have different ways of getting the users into that group tag. Um, so the traditional way um, would be some kind of dynamic authentication, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and certainly for the flexibility, we, we prefer the dy dynamic model. So meaning, dynamic meaning, I don't have to use subnets or VLANs anymore. I can say this person and this person are both in this group, even though they're in different subnets, different VLANs. That's right. I don't care, but I need them to have the same policy. That's right. And it's really... Um, 
part of their user login. Mm -hmm. uh, it could also be like you know a specific device if they have these kind of mobile phones or this IoT device. So once I've identified what they are, I just put them into a group, and it doesn't matter anymore where they're actually located. But can we still do it the more traditional way? Yeah. So you know maybe your company's not quite ready for mm -hmm. this full dynamic classification. Um, common examples are like dot one X uh, MAC address bypass. Um, but this has been kind of itself a growing pain for, for different customers. So if you're not quite ready for that, you can actually you know, make these static associations. Um, so you've probably built your VLANs in a certain way, you've built your IP subnets in a certain way. You know, th this is where the doctors are, this is where the engineering right, department right. is. And then you can just directly map that VLAN or that IP subnet to an SGT. So I can kind of keep that traditional model and maybe migrate slowly. slowly. Move there. Yeah. That's right. I like that. So this slide, uh, it's really just to kind of give you a visual reference, put it all together, right? I keep talking about the, the magic of the overlay and, and putting these values into the encapsulation. So uh, in this example, uh, the first hop device figures out who you are, puts you into a group, right? Um, and along with that group, I'm going to put you into a specific virtual network, right? So everything, you know, it's secure. Mm -hmm. I know where you are. It's independent of your current IP subnet. That VRF information. That's right. <laughs> Um, I pack that into the VXLAN header, and then I, because it's a VXLAN's an IP header, it can travel all the way over the network, finally gets to the other side, he mm -hmm. takes it out, and now I can actually do that, that group-based enforcement on the other side. And I don't care where these switches are, they might even be in two totally different buildings or something, but... Yeah, as long as you give me IP from the two things, mm -hmm. they, they can be as far apart as necessary. Awesome. Before I go, I want to leave you guys with a couple of key points, okay. um, you know, uh, in other episodes, we talked a lot about uh, the DNA center and software-defined access. So, you know, uh, that's this DNA controller, the importance of ICE, importance of uh, analytics engine, those kind of things. Um, but as far as the campus fabric, uh, you know, just some key things to kind of leave you with. Um, and we talked about them from a technical terms. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a translation for all of these in, in Lisp terms. Um, but what we wanted to do for Campus Fabric was simplify things, sure. right? So what we've done is we've kind of uh, changed the terminology a little bit. Um, and, you know, I'll start out with the control plane node. That, that's your list map server. Okay, so the, like, these are the roles of the Campus of Fabric. Of the Campus Fabric. So the, the map server, great. Keeps track of everything. Mm -hmm. um, next is the border nodes, mm -hmm. like the name suggests. Uh, he talks inside the fabric. He also talks outside the fabric. Uh -huh. uh, the customs officer of, that's right, that's <laughs> of right. the Campus Fabric. Um, and then uh, the fabric edge nodes. So these are where you know your access layer switches, where the users actually connect. He's responsible for doing the identity part. Mm -hmm. And um, can't forget wireless. That's right. Uh, uh, so this is one of the, the new additions also to Campus Fabric. Um, so instead of just doing a traditional wireless, uh, we're going to actually integrate the wireless mobility with mm -hmm. the control plane. So now all the wireless clients get the same capabilities as the wired clients. That's awesome for host mobility. I mean, that's wireless is obviously very important, just Absolutely. as important as wired. So that's very cool. Um, remember three things, right? VXLAN, Lisp, and uh, Cisco Trust Stack. That's, that's what right. we really need to look into. Um, thanks so much, Sean. That was so informational. My I really pleasure. appreciate it. And. Thank you for watching the Software Defined Access show. We did a deep dive today. If you're dying to see DNA Center uh, GUI or a demo, please watch our intro show. Thank you for watching today. Be sure and follow us online. All of our social media stuff is on the screen. Check us out on Facebook, on Twitter, all of the usual channels. And you can always find all the shows, including the back catalog, at techwisetv.com. See you on the next one.